And welcome back to Weather and Egg in Focus on this Monday. It is 106, and, well, the sun is about to go fully eclipsed for some people today. we got a rundown on the forecast. A few of us around our area maybe might kind of see it. Far northwest Minnesota and the far northern valley north of Grand Forks, I think we'll see um, the best chance. We're seeing breaks in the clouds right now. So. I mean, I tell you what, I'm watching it right now on the TV screen. It looks pretty cool. It's just about to go dark in Mexico. Don't stare at it. I'm going to stare at it all day long so I can file disability on Tuesday. Perfect. I've got sunglasses. Does that mean I can stare at it? Sure, why not? Go for it. He said I could. <laughs> don't, 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 first off, don't believe anything that comes out of his mouth. That's the last thing you want to do. Uh, anyway, well, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us today. We'll have a rundown on the forecast, the probability of seeing the eclipse in our area, and what time it's going to peak. Zero. As well, zero. Like zero dark 30. Zero chance of seeing it here in the FM area. I mean, there's a chance it might get a little darker outside, maybe. That's the only thing you're going to see. So you're technically, not gonna... you'll be able to see it, at least notice it. Notice it, not see it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Bridget. Are you, are you starting to get mad yet? I'm hanging out here because I realized that we missed the boat by all of the farms that are in the path of the eclipse in Ohio and Indiana are cashing in with the total eclipse of the farm days that they are hosting. Yeah, they got all sorts of stuff going down there. So we got to talk about that a little bit and uh, touch on that egg topic you just mentioned. What's going on with all the farms over the total eclipse and biosecurity for presenting bird flu. Preventing yes. bird flu. We'll touch Preventing on that one place. as well. And uh, there's a census of ag of South Dakota, I believe, as well, Bridget. Am I uh, mistaken there? We did this. Uh, the re most recent census of agriculture was completed in 2022, or based on those stats anyway. The one prior to that was 2017. And we have some comparison figures. We've talked about North Dakota and a little bit of Minnesota's, but we'll touch on South Dakota statistics as well for right now. Very cool. Very cool. We'll run down all those. We got a guest that'll be joining us here in our 120 segment from Gowan. That's uh, Marsha Van Leer. And uh, Marsha, how are you doing? A little depressed that I don't see the eclipse. You know, I, I got to say it. I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of feeling the same thing, but at least we got this beautiful HD TV where we can see it. We don't need those silly glasses. And it, I, I, I think it looks kind of cool. Look at that. No, you've never, you've never, see, you've no never one? seen one before? No, I've never seen one oh, before. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Not the one, old like you, Dean. The what? <laughs> the I one, haven't been around that long. The one in 2000. There was just one in 2017. It wasn't here, though. No, you had to travel. Yeah, I didn't travel for that one. All right. Well, sorry to hear that. I don't even. Was it even a partial cool. here during the last one uh, in 17? I, mean, I don't remember if it was. If it, it was. It was a partial. Partial, yeah. Would, not much. But yeah. It's probably cloudy again. Yeah. It is. For I think everything. actually, I think it was cloudy up here the last time in seventeen when it happened. Was it? it was in I don't June, think it I was. Think because I remember August. being outside with a welding August, helmet. August, you're right. Yep. You looked at it through a welding yeah. helmet. Yeah. I have How'd a that work? Helmet. Did it work out? Doesn't all right? everybody? Yeah, you could see no, what was no. going on. Worked out well. Dean, do you got a welding helmet? No, we had the glasses. We had Marcia? special glasses. Ah, I, I, I do. I want a welding helmet. I want a welder. We welding was a lot of fun. I used to do that back back in the day. Don't want you anywhere near any hot material that you got to weld. Hey, I was a great welder. Sure. Oh, we get to the forecast. I welded my whole Jetta. That thing held up pretty good. <laughs> well past the years it should have. That's for sure. Well past it. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we got to check on the forecast, Dean. What's the rest of the day looking like? Well, we're like? looking at cloudy skies. There's still a few uh, light showers out in Lakes Country pivoting westward towards the valley. So could see a few light sprinkles this afternoon. Not looking at anything uh, really to write home about, but enough to kind of uh, eh, dot up that windshield if you're out traveling. Temperatures today in the upper 40s. We're in the mid-40s right now, although in the northern valley and northwest Minnesota where uh, uh, there there is some sunshine, uh, temperatures are in the 50s. So where there's uh, clear skies, and again, there's not much of it, but uh, the north central part of the state seeing some clearing skies in northwestern Minnesota and the far northern valley uh, seeing some breaks in the clouds. Uh, that Those areas will be in the 50s today, the rest of us in the 40s. Then as we head into tonight, we're looking at temperatures dipping down into the mid-30s and more sunshine as we head into your Tuesday. A beautiful day. Highs right around 60, give or take a couple degrees with light winds out of the west-southwest. Clouds come back on Wednesday, some showers developing, especially late in the day. Highs right around 60, showers continue Wednesday night, and then breezy and cooler on Thursday. 
with highs dropping back into the lower 50s. So all in all, not a bad looking forecast. We did get some much needed rain after the hurricane on Saturday. Oh, whoa, producing... whoa, you can't call it that. I just did. All right. Hurricane and uh, man, I'll tell you what, if you were out in the open areas, the, the amount of blowing dirt, oh, it was terrible. And uh, thankfully, we got that rain to kind of settle down that uh, top layer of soil. That should help a little bit, Bridget. But, boy, areas in the Northern Valley, again, that didn't get the precip, uh, we're going to have another wind machine coming in here early next week with a lot of wind. But we're going to get some rain with it as well. That's next week, though. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for all of that. Um, First of all, you have fields, and Marsha will probably chime in on this as well, but you have a lot of fields that don't have much plant material on them, whether it be soybeans, Mm -hmm. dry beans, sugar beets. So you've got loose soils and you don't have any, any moisture to hold them down. That's been you know wet and frozen and or snowfall, which was not unusual. It is already into April. You have areas where water may be melted and sat and it left behind that very fine silty layer. And that's likely what you're seeing below as well. I, I get, I get a lot of uh, impressions from social media and I saw quite a bit over the weekend where people were pointing the finger and blaming uh, farmers for so many different practices. But remember, it wasn't just fields that were blowing. If you saw open construction sites where they are trying to do the, the, the work and the, you know, the dirt work basically, and they're trying to get that done and there's nothing to hold down that ground at this point. It's just a situation that's going to happen, unfortunately. Now, if we can keep the wind down, that would be awesome. But we know that we only have so much control over that type of weather situation. Right. With shelter belts, I mean, a lot of the shelter belts being taken taken out, would, it, would that have helped at all? I mean, you're still going to get... In some situations. Yeah. but you're, And, and it's, the shelter belts are being taken out because they were planted in a timeline to grow fast and quickly. So they're not... They're not great trees. You know, there's so many things that break down really easy, like caraganas or um, some of those other, you know, easy to plant, fast to grow trees. What's going to happen, though, is you see shelter belts also being replaced. Folks don't necessarily realize that because, well, those trees are short, right? You see the big ones being taken out, but you don't realize the little ones that are being replanted in a different spacing. So those will help as well. Hmm. Very interesting. Hopefully no more snow. Just we can handle rain, but... Uh, you know, like I was saying, I'd be all right with a little more snow. I know you're all just looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm not the only one out there. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the few. How's That's that? all right. We're in spring mode right now, man. Don't, don't the few control everything nowadays? <laughs> in some places they do, yeah. Yeah, so let's yeah. get some snow in here. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, now, yeah, one more. Some hoorah. of those things that... Well, some of those things that, yeah, you know, when you said that, what's being controlled out there? Okay, so let's go back to the whole eclipse and where it's actually happening because there is an expectation that you will see some unusual activity with animals and wildlife. So researchers in the UK are asking for the public's help in posting, tweeting when they send out their pictures to say what they noticed. Did the birds stop singing? Are the frogs chirping like it's dusk? Do you see nocturnal animals go uh, either coming out like deer are usually not very prevalent during the day or do you or even raccoons or do you see animals like domesticated livestock heading back to the barn or stopping feeding because they realize that this is sort of an off pattern for them. But security is a bigger concern amongst many of those farms. You're seeing folks that are stopping and parking in fields or pasture land. It's calving season in a number of areas yet. I don't think I would suggest to anybody I know to park and start just walking through a pasture looking for a great place to go watch the eclipse because if there are some new mama heifers out there, they aren't going to take it very kindly that you're new and strange and in their pasture. So. Would you want to be chased down by a 1,200 pound cow in the dark? Probably not. Um, Been there. It's not as much fun as one might think. (laughs) Also, farmers are restricting access to their yards and blocking off things like their silos or hiding ladders so people can't get on their buildings. It's going to be totally dark. I don't understand why people think that they need to climb on top of a silo or the top of a building 
in order to watch more dark. I, I, I'm not really sure what they're thinking, but um, <laughs> we have to remember that this can be trespass laws. Uh, schools are closed in that area. A lot of businesses are closed. Maybe they felt like productivity was going to be down overall, but also farmers are not taking equipment out on the road today because they don't want to have to run into problems with uh, heavy traffic areas too. So there's a lot of side effects to the eclipse that you might not think about. I'm sure there are. And if anyone uh, wants to chime in on that, feel free to give us a call on the Red Wing Shoes phone line. That's 701-293-9000. How'd your animals react back in 2017 during the last eclipse or partial eclipse if it did any uh, thing to them, if it was enough of a change? Uh, feel free to chime in and let us know. Marsh, no? I think the weirdest thing when I went through it, and it was a total eclipse where I was at, was like bridges, the birds start chirp. The, the birds think it's nighttime, and all of a sudden, it's mm-hmm. weird because it just it, it goes, you know, pretty much dark for a short period of time, and the birds start singing. It's like, wow, that's kind of weird in the middle of the daytime, you know, stuff like that. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I wish would have paid more attention Very back in twenty seventeen. <laughs> it's just starting my college, uh, second college journey, seventeen. Oh, gee, well then, yeah, we know, we all know why you, you weren't paying attention yeah. then. We refer to it might as have the been dark focused year. on. Yeah, there's some other things you might have been focused on instead, right? Yeah, like schoolwork. So, yeah, right. That, absolutely, that's, that's what yeah. I would have been doing too. Yeah, lots mm-hmm. of schoolwork. Well, you can focus on all sorts of better things after we hear from the American Ag Network, because again, we are joined in studio by Marsha Van Leer. She is with Gowan Company. They're one of our sponsors for Here We Grow. We're going to talk about some of those changes going from raising soybeans to raising corn this year and Gowan's part they're going to play in all of that. So be right back.
And a welcome back to Weather and Egg in Focus. Glad you're joining us. And some of you talked about a change earlier, what with the eclipse and so forth. Well, I had a quick change here myself because our guest today is Marsha Van Leer with Gowan Company. We're going to talk about corn. So Marsha made sure that we, she texted me earlier, we both have our corn shirts ready and available to lead this conversation. So thank you, Marsha, for that idea. That was great. No problem. <laughs> So speaking of a change, for those of you who might be looking for a change in careers, it's time to check out mortonbuildings.com slash careers. They are a 100% employee owned facility or company. They build facilities all over the region. They have chance for you to get on the job training, upward mobility, earn great pay and benefits. So check them out, mortonbuildings.com slash careers. Marsha, you have a long career in agronomy. Fill people in just a little bit of who you are. I mean, you and I have known each other for quite some time, but give us a little bit of background if you could. So a very long year or career, I should say, in agronomy. <laughs> um, I went to NDSU for plant sciences, and I should say I grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota, and uh, my dad wasn't quite sure about me going into agriculture, but I was like, well, hey, I'm going to, so there you go. <laughs> um, I did probably about 20 years of retail agronomy before I switched over to my current uh, role with Gowan. And uh, biggest difference I can say between the two is I don't work a lot of weekends anymore, which is kind of nice. My first, uh, my first spring season, though, I was like, what do I do? I was home. I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> It was crazy. There are some, there's some massive changes when you go from retail to doing what you do at a, at a manufacturer level versus distribution. And and speaking of manufacturer, um, for Gowan, what are some of the products that you bring to the market in this region? So um, Gowan does a lot of taking old products and making them great again, I guess we'll say. Um, that was my <laughs> slogan in 2000, <clears throat> excuse me. 2016, when we bought Sonaland from Dow. Um, Bridget, you know Sonaland. That was one of your main products and favorites. When I was actually um, in the hiring process, my boss couldn't tell me at the time, but he said, we're bringing a product to the market that you are very familiar with in your area. Well, working with edible beans, I mean, Sonaland was my go-to. When it was announced that Sonaland was purchased, I was like, Merry Christmas to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know this one. Um, <clears throat> so we do, we have Sonaland, we have Treflan, um, Halo Sulf, you were on permit. We, uh, brought over from Monsanto at the time. Quasalifop, we, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, we signed an agreement with, with Nissan for, it was Assure 2. DuPont was able to keep the Assure 2 name and we brought on Targa. Um, we have a Fiance fungicide, which is tetraconazole plus uh, azoxystrobin. We have Dolmark, which has been out on the market for quite a few years. Um, it was eminent in the sugar beet market and Dolmark in the corn and soybean market. Um, and now it's actually in the edible bean, sugar beet, and canola market. So we've so we've for got Gowan. A... Go ahead, Marcia. Finish. I was gonna say <laughs> we have we have quite the portfolio. To be honest, it's it's. We're not just a corn and soybean. We have specialty markets. Absolutely. You have a broad swath of products here, and the names that you listed are very familiar to many in the ag industry. And one of the reasons we wanted to visit today was you were with us on our Here We Grow project last year for soybeans. And now as we move to corn and with your agronomy background in retail and so forth, we wanted to talk about those differences of what it's like raising soybeans to what it's like raising corn. And I do want to give a reminder to all of our listeners, if you have questions for us, you can reach out at 701-293-9000. That's our Red Wing shoe, shoe line. So you can ask those questions of Marsha. And okay, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you talk with growers in the difference of maybe weed control or even fungicide control when you're going from soybeans to corn in this region, Marsha? Probably the biggest difference um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, one of the biggest differences <laughs> in soybeans, we use fungicide. Corn, it's not as prevalent as using fungicide up here. Um, it's not like in I states where we're using fungicides down there at Tassel. We have growers, the progressive growers up here are using the fungicide. Um, 
we're seeing more and more usage now in corn where we haven't in the past. Um, weed control in corn is probably more extensive, I feel, in, in corn. We have a few more products that we can use as, a, as opposed to soybeans. Um, farmers are willing to spend money on corn where maybe True. they haven't spent it on soybeans. Um, soybeans have kind of been a forgotten crop, I believe. Um, and that's changing now with, with the growers and, and the progression and stuff. That has been changing. So it's been quite interesting to see the, I guess, the path forward. Let's just say that. Well, and I think with corn in this region, we have a lot of area facilities that are set up and ready to roll for it. Um, soybeans are probably a little bit easier when it comes to handling. So if you're a dedicated corn grower, you're doing that with the end in mind. You've got the equipment, you've you've planned for it, you have storage capacity. Maybe those are things that we should have. So I don't know if we have room in the parking lot to put up a bin for our corn storage, but maybe we should consider it, right? Wait for the market to turn the right way for us. <laughs> I, I remember, I can't remember what meeting it was. I just remember the meeting. And um, at the time, the person presenting, he said, if you're going to grow corn, you need to have trucks and you need to have bins. You need to have storage mm -hmm. space and you need to be able to transport it. Um, so now, you, you know, you see the drying systems that are coming online. Uh, the growers have the drying systems now, where in the past they haven't. And the elevators, the capacity that the elevators have increased with their storage and their dryer systems, it's, it's been interesting, you know, coming from southern Minnesota and the systems that we had compared to coming up here. It was a little bit of a culture shock, I'll be honest. And it's, we're, we're seeing the movement now. Marsha, why is it that some you would need to dry dry down your corn in a and basically cook it in, in these different types of dryers? What, what's the purpose behind that, and why do it? Or I guess is, is it even a necessity that you have to do it? It really depends on the variety. So, um, wet corn can get very hot and start on fire. Um, you'll see in the fall they'll talk about dryer fires around. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of the times because they've had buildup. Um, the corn's been too wet. Um, if you've ever seen like a bale that's been baled wet and it just combusts, wet corn can do that. Um, just from the heat of itself breaking down? Right. And the other thing with wet corn, if it goes into a storage bin, it can bridge up. And then um, you can have instances where you're trying to pull that corn out and have entrapment. Mm -hmm. um, which is where the safety aspect comes into play. Um, we still have too many people that are entering bins of corn that is bridged up or even, you know, in a, in a certain instance, soybeans that are bridged up, and we're, we're losing people, and we shouldn't be doing that. Right. Have there been any things like that in our area in recent years where – corn either got put away too wet and it caught on fire in a bin or some something like that around our area in recent years or has it kind of been a while and people have been pretty good on it or making sure that their corn is dry enough for storage um every year we hear of entrapment issues mm -hmm. um i don't necessarily know about any fires sure. um, but we do have the entrapment issues and that's an every year thing i see and then you said there were kind of a difference in the varieties where some mm -hmm. corns are you need to dry down and other corns you don't? So um, when I talk about varieties, it's maturity. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a early maturing corn, say a 78-day, 80-day corn, and we have a decent growing season, that can dry down in the field fairly quickly. Okay. And growers will take that off at, you know, 12 moisture, and they don't have to worry about anything. But some growers will push their maturity, so they'll go 89, 90, 92-day um, Depending on the growing season, it'll come off wet. And that's when we have to put it into the, the dryer. It has to go through the dryer system and dry down and then be put into um, basically dry storage. I see. And I know we're, we're running low on time here, but since, since we're talking about it, I want to sneak it in here quick. And I don't know if you'll be able to, to answer this or not, but it seems if you're extending the maturity of your corn to try and get, say, a larger yield, from your corn, is the difference in what that extra yield would be, is that going to outweigh the cost of needing to dry 
all of that corn down? It all uh, depends yeah. on the year. It's, it you know, what's what's going to be the, the cost of propane at the time? Mm-hmm. Have you forward contracted your propane? Um, what's going to be your cost of storage? Is the elevator going to take anything off? Because elevators, um, when you bring it in wet, they have to dry it down. So is that going to cost you anything? Mm-hmm. It, it really just depends on the year. I see. Well, if you're listening, you got a question, you want to get that asked, feel free to give us a call on the Red Wing Shoes phone line. That's 701-293-9000. Emails of the program are weather or ag at flagfamily.com, and as well as those comment boxes over there on Facebook and YouTube Live. And, yes, hello, Steve. Hello, Dirk. Thank you guys for watching again today. We're going to take a short moment, get caught up with Bob of the Hour News. When we come back, we'll rejoin our conversation with Marsha. And, again, if you got any questions, feel free to reach out. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And hello, thank you for being here on Weather and Ag in Focus. So glad that you are joining us today. And 
if you have a chance to get out before a happy hour, stop by your local liquor store and check out North Dakota Sweet Crude or Sweet Crude Orange. Don't miss out on these great flavors. They have a smooth cinnamon spice flavor, and the Sweet Crude Orange has that same smooth finish with a splash of orange. There are samplings coming up next week, April 18th, at the Bottle Barn on South University in Fargo. The next day on the 19th at Cash Wide Liquors on Veterans Boulevard in Fargo. And if you're looking for recipes, and who isn't, you should head over to crudespirits.com to find more recipes. All right. Glad you all are here. If you've been paying attention on our live stream on Facebook, YouTube, or Acres TV, you'll see that Marsha Van Leer, our guest from Gowan today, we're both sporting our corn shirts. Thanks, Marsha. I guess we're... Um, a cob of a, off the same cob, perhaps a cob of the same kind. What do you want to call that? <laughs> we're just we're corny. thinking similar in our dress there you code. Go. Two kernels in a <laughs> can. Dress code. Two Ooh. kernels in a can. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're not. No cans. No can corn's not good. <laughs> That's a good point. Can corn's not awesome. <laughs> just, just wrong. <laughs> stop. Just, just, just stop. Uh, okay. Go Mar ahead, Dean. Yeah, so Marsha, <laughs> last year we grew beans, okay, and uh, that's you know, wildly inappropriate. Yeah, we need uh, you know this year we're doing corn. Is there is there any big difference in terms of moisture that each crop needs, or are they the same? So it's um, timing is really the the biggest difference when it comes to corn and soybeans. Um, corn we want moisture early on um, when it gets to about that V. Five v six, you know that's when yield gets set early in corn. Like early on, as in like May, May, June, July, because we do want it through tasseling. Okay. Um, soybeans, you know, we need we need moisture early. Yes, obviously to get the crop up and going, but we really want moisture in August when we're at pod fill. Okay. Um, that's when we we talk about a million dollar rain in August with soybeans because. As those pods are filling, that's when we want that moisture. Um, for corn, we want it early on. Um, like I said, corn, the yield gets set early. So the number of rows around the cob gets set. Um, really, the cob length almost gets set. So that all gets set early on. Um, and then we also want moisture when we're tasseling. And heat is really the biggest issue with corn. Um, we also want heat, but not a lot of heat. Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, we had some issues last year, especially up around the Canadian border, where it was so hot up there, the corn crop got pushed. And they mm -hmm. were tasseling around the 4th of July, which is unheard of. Wow. Um, and, I mean, we're talking corn was like three feet tall and it was tasseling, which is hmm. not good. Yeah. Not good at all. So I got what you were kind of saying, uh, you know, the heat – isn't a good thing. And I'll just give you the example from my buddy's farm down in Nalm, Minnesota. Where? Uh, New Alm. Oh, I know where that's at. Over by uh that's my wedding over reception. by Mankato. I grew up down there. <laughs> ah, nice. I grew yeah. up forty five miles. Cool. Straight south of New Alm. Love New Alm. Never been. Love it. It's um, a great place. Uh, home of uh, Shells Brewing. Shells Brewery and Grain Belt. And Buddy's mm. Soda. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, they got hit with a really big heat wave down there at the wrong time, and it screwed them out of their yields. Why did that happen when it comes to corn? Why is the excessive heat in June going to totally screw over the yield in corn if it's too hot for too long? Or June. There's a specific time in there. I think it was right around tasseling, or July maybe is when it happened. Excuse me. So what happens is um, at tasseling and then when the silks are out, so that's where the basically germinating, I guess, fertilizing of the corn mm -hmm. kernel comes into play. <clears throat> so what happens is we want it to be about um, 85. When it gets above 85, that's when we start seeing um, where that dies off. And then what happens is it doesn't get down to the silk or the silk gets pushed or the silk hasn't come out. So it can't fertilize that. That silk basically is mm -hmm. what's happening. Um, and then that's where we see the, the decrease in yield. So um, from the tassel, the pollen comes down, the pollen dies. 
is, I guess, the best way to put it. Okay. Um, and then if, if it dies, it's not getting into that silk. It's not right. fertilizing that kernel. Mm-hmm. And that's where you'll see, um, you can see it in sweet corn too in the summer. If you've ever seen a cob that hasn't been, um, we call it filled very well, you'll see missing kernels and whatnot in there. And that's what's happening. So it got pushed at tassel or it got pushed at silking. That happened to my corn in our backyard. Only half the cobs filled out and the top halves were just nothing. Just dead, shriveled up. I saw that a lot um, in cornfields that I was in last summer. And then also, of course, our friend that gives us sweet corn. There you go. Call right now. Caller number five. You're going to get uh, entered to win yourself $1,000. The opportunity, 701-293-9000. Caller number five, Addison, you're able to take that? Awesome, thank you. So, Marsha, yep. since we're talking about corn, let's just kind of go through two very simplified answers here on a good outcome for either when we want the rain and when we want temperatures to just be nice. What would be like, a, like an optimal year for corn, the timely rains when it needs to come, and then what would be a couple of things we should – not want to happen like it to be a hundred degrees for two weeks in July or it doesn't rain over this month or just kind of something like that when it comes to growing corn up here so both of those and really who likes a hundred degrees Dean. I mean, sorry no mm. as long as it's a dry, dry heat, heat. <laughs> prefer my dry cold no 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 <laughs> um so once again it all comes down to variety and day length um Depending on the grower and depending on the, the day length of corn, it's, you know, that whole window is different. But really, when corn starts tasseling, we really don't want it to be 100 degrees at that time. You know, we want it to be 85. High humidity is okay. We're okay with mm-hmm. that. Um, overnight temperatures, you know, get the overnight temperatures down too. So if our overnight temperatures are under 85, really that 80, 85 mark, that's great. When the temperatures don't cool down in the summer at night, that's also when we run into issues. Um, and really, we want rain throughout the whole growing season. It can, for corn, it can shut off. You know, August, it'll it'll start onion leafing a little bit. But really, the corn is made at that time. It's fine. Okay. And that's just it. There's, a, a like you said, all about timing. That happened to be done at that point in time, right? So that's perfect. <laughs> and... One of the things, Marcia, that I think I also want to mention, when you think about your career and the time frame of what you've seen in corn genetics, as you've gone from your start to where we might be today, can you think of a couple of things that have changed uh, pretty largely in that time frame? And I, I preface that with the fact that uh, we're getting great seed genetics this year from Dairy Land Seed Company. And I'm looking forward to watching this corn grow and kind of coaching it along through the season. But what are some of the changes you've witnessed over your years of selling seed corn? So the whole reason why I started in agronomy other than growing up on a farm is my senior year of high school, I wanted to do a research paper. This is when Roundup Ready was first coming out. You could hear the rumblings and the, and the whole breeding and gene editing and gene targeting, I should say, was just coming out. Um, I actually had gone to an Asgrow concept grower and asked, you know, for information and all of a sudden I had a summer job. Um, when Roundup first came out, that was the best thing ever because I grew up on a farm and cockleber was our weed. And to this day, if I see cockleber or velvet leaf, I will pull it because I have muscle memory. <laughs> yes, that's how it was. <laughs> I grew up riding soybeans, which you guys probably yeah. don't know what riding soybeans was. It was quite the thing. Um, right. But it- Explain the riding soybeans because you have folks who don't know what that means. This was prior to Roundup Ready traits in in soybeans and it was literally hand removal so um i i graduated from walking soybeans we had a walking crew um to basically it's a bar in front mounted in front of the tractor and there's four seats and there's in between the the two seats there's a uh tank of water and roundup mixed up and there's four hoses and guns and you ride down the field and you each have so many rows and 
That's what it was. I mean, that's how I paid for my fair hogs and everything with dad. And then I'd hire out when we were done, then I'd hire out to the neighbors. And that was my high school or my, my grade school spending money. Um, that's how we paid for our school supplies. So we went from that. And then of course on our farm, like I said, cockleburr. So we get into a cockleburr patch and I'd, we'd stop. Dad would literally stop the tractor. We'd have to get off and pull cockleburr. I hate cockleburr. It's the bane of my existence. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, you know, some of the genetics that have changed. So insect pressure, um, the, the, um, corn borer was huge. Well, the genetics that came about of helping us so that we don't necessarily have the corn borer issues that we've had in the past, um, the herbicide tolerance has been huge. You know, we're cutting back on what we're putting out in those fields these days, which, you know, herbicide is bad. That's what everybody, you know, you, the people that are so far away from the farm, that's what they're thinking. You know, we're, we're just pouring all this on. We're not because of the traits that are now in these, in these corn plants. We're not pouring everything on them that we've had to in the past to take care of the weed control. Um, the disease resistance that's out there now, disease, um, the disease pressure has grown. So disease resistance is huge. I mean, there's, there's drought tolerance that's out there. Um, I don't know that we see the drought tolerant varieties up here quite as much as what we've seen in the, or as, you know, we've seen in other places. Um, just the, the technology that goes in, I mean, there's quizolifop tolerant corn now. There's, I mean, there's so many different genetics that are in corn now that it's made it so that we're able to grow it up here and, and be profitable in growing it or actually being able to make a crop in it is, I guess, the biggest thing. That's a huge point right there is just what's changed for where we live and why we now have become a corn growing powerhouse, which wasn't always expected for little North Dakota and, and Northern Minnesota. So... Marsha, I want to say thank you for coming in today. I know we're going to talk to you throughout the season as we continue with our Here We Grow project, Raising Corn This Year. Gowan, who Marsha works for, is one of our sponsors, as well as Dairyland Seed and Ellingson Drainage. Thank you to all three of those companies. And Marsha, if people want to know more about Gowan, where would they go? Um, Our website is www.gowanco.com. And... On our website, you'll be able to see who your rep is and any variety or any uh, chemicals that we have. You'll be able to see the labels, anything like that. And then um, you can always find me on social media. So if you ever have questions, just uh, look for me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Not a great poster, but uh, be watching because I will have some stuff coming this year with my dog is going to help me with some scouting, and I also have Betty yep. S. Beat updates coming. <laughs> I am so excited. I kind of know the background on those. They're going to be awesome. I'll help you retweet them and whatnot. So, all right. Thank you again, Marsha. Folks listening, don't go anywhere. We still have Cheyenne Garden Trivia today, and you're going to want to be here so that you can get your $10 gift certificate. We'll be right back.
And welcome back to Weather and Ag and Focus, 153 in the afternoon, and uh, it's getting darker out. It's getting darker, yeah. and I'm scared, and yeah. I ain't got my blanket or yeah. my hot dog. What is <laughs> Hot dog in a blanket? All right. That's a joke. Uh, is it 2 o'clock yet? Anyway, yeah, it's 153. We've degrees. got temperatures of 47 degrees. Uh, again, if you're in the far northern valley, northwestern corner of Minnesota, seeing enough breaks in the clouds, should be able to see this partial eclipse in our area. Uh, but again, that's way north. And uh, again, that's most of the area. We're socked in the cloud cover. But you will see it get a little darker here uh, shortly after 2 o'clock. Uh, but nothing... Uh, Nothing like they're seeing down uh, to our south with the total eclipse down into areas of uh, uh, Dallas through Little Rock and up through uh, Indianapolis. Uh, for our area, we're looking at the uh, clouds around. Uh, yeah, maybe still a few light showers throughout the area today. Not a big deal. Upper 40s, wind switching to the northwest. And rain ends tonight. We'll drop down into the mid-30s. And sunshine finally returns for Tuesday. I'd call that probably the pick day of the week, although Friday won't be bad either. But uh, Tuesday looking pretty good. Uh, with highs again right around 60 degrees and uh, breezy and really some nice spring warmth coming in here as we head into the weekend and to start off next week when temperatures will be back up into the 70s. That's right nice. On. Maybe even some springtime thunderstorms mm. for next week. That will feel nice as well. Very, Finally. It's very nice. Finally. All right. Well, it's now time. For Cheyenne Garden Trivia, be the first person to call in with the correct answer. You'll win yourself a $10 certificate to Cheyenne Gardens, just 10 miles north of Fargo. And your question for today for Cheyenne Gardens Trivia is, what is the most common color geranium? What is the most common color geranium? 701 293 Nine thousand is Polka the dot. red wing shoes. Darn it, Dean! Come on, man. You have to have another question. Hey, you now. ever you ever seen a solar eclipse from a satellite before? Take a look at this. I know. This looks super yeah. cool. It's tripping the whole system. I have out. been. I did get a message from a, a listener in Iowa who said that the temperature has really cooled off down there. They're not directly in the totality path, but it's getting. Oh, cool. I'm sure it will yeah. get. Cool. Oh, it can drop five to ten degrees once it goes total eclipse. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of neat. That's another neat part. Hi there, caller. What's your name? Matthew. What do you think the uh, the answer is? Yellow. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. It's not yellow, but thanks for playing. Hi there, caller. What's your name? Judy. Judy, what do you think the most common color geranium is? Red. Red is the correct answer. You are our winner today. Well, you hit the wrong sounder. <laughs> yeah, I know I did. Okay. I'm just... <laughs> Dinking around. <laughs> Judy, congratulations on winning your $10 certificate to Cheyenne Garden. Stay on the line here. Our producer will get a little information from you and uh, tell you how you can claim that certificate that will be valid on the 15th of April for about 60 some days or so. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening, Judy. Appreciate it. All right. Nice and easy one to start off a Monday. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Do we have time for a quick ag topic? Sure Bridget? do. All right. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things that people are asking lots of questions about right now has to be the bird flu that's affecting other animals. We've heard it in dairy cattle in other states. Also, there was a goat in Minnesota. Some of the biosecurity options in order to keep our animals safe would be to prevent their contact with the wild migratory birds as much as possible uh, because it's not only in if they're sharing stock tanks, ponds, and dams with other livestock where they can leave the virus behind, it's if those birds are on haystacks or silage piles and when they defecate on them, well, that in fact can wind up in the animal's feed. And that's where we're seeing some of the transfer of the situation uh, of the virus to others. Uh, in fact, the goat in Minnesota that was affected, that was due to a shared water tank. So if we can try to prevent those types of things, that would help tremendously. Not always so easy because those migratory birds, they don't stop and ask a lot of questions. Right. Can I eat here? Is it <laughs> right. all right if I drink? Hey, Bridget, yeah, do you know what the goat friendly. said that got bird flu? Oh, no. Really? <laughs> Did it? That's what I thought. <laughs> Glad we got it in today, guys. <sighs> Eight more to go. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Well, <laughs> well, we'll be back tomorrow from 1 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We hope to hear and see you there.
Enjoy the eclipse for those that get to see it. We'll be back again tomorrow. The Jay Thomas Show is coming up next.